kind introduction, Brian. Um, let me uh, start by uh, explaining why we want to talk about a 20-year-old R&D project. Um, um, a few years back, Brian and I worked together with colleagues at NREL and, and Sandia National Laboratory to develop a, a roadmap on grid forming inverter research needs for the Department of Energy. That's the roadmap that led to the solicitation, which Unify ultimately won. And um, in that roadmap, we, we, we postulated a, a, a development path for grid forming technologies that would first start out being applied in, in, in microgrids of distributed generation. And so one of the reasons why we're talking to you about this old R&D project today is, you know, to my knowledge, it was the first well-publicized demonstration of the use of grid forming controls implemented in inverters at, uh, in commercial prototypes, you know, using actual distributed generation equipment. Um, and more importantly, um, we collected a lot of data. We did, uh, you know, we did 10 years of testing out there at the, um, at the test bed at American Electric Power. And we saved all the data. And Karen has just made all that data available for you all to use. So uh, the purpose of today's talk is for me to do the sort of the ancient history lesson of what was the microgrid and what were we trying to accomplish and, and what did we accomplish? Then I'm going to turn it over to Kieran. And Kieran, well, why am I talking? Because I was the PI for the Microgrid project. Sorry, I need to say that. But Kieran is the uh, pr uh, the principal investigator for LBL's participation in Unify, and he'll use the second third of this talk to really introduce you to the, to the data sets that he has curated down and put together and make to make available for researchers to use. And he'll use the last part of his talk really to talk about why you might want to use some of those data. He's already done some simulation work and is using the data to, to validate those simulations. And we're hoping that by introducing you to this a very rich data set, you'll be inspired to follow up and begin using it to self, help inform your own experiments and your own simulation and analysis studies within Unify and outside of Unify. Uh, so with that, let me go ahead and get started with the, uh, the ancient history lesson. So this project really uh, was born in the late 1990s. This was a time when the electricity industry was undergoing a dramatic restructuring. We know quite a bit now about what happened at transmission and bulk power with the creation of ISOs and RTOs. But at that time, there was also a tremendous interest in essentially uh, unbundling distribution and having a retail competition and lots of distributed generation. That was really um, supported by advances in material science that were leading to, uh, at that time, a small micro turbines. And if you remember called capstone micro, we were gonna actually try and put capstone micro turbines into the search micro grid but the advantage of these uh, small distributed generation systems was that they were very expensive. And in fact, DOE had an entire R&D program built around distributed generation because there was a belief that distributed generation might make a uh, transmission of the next stranded asset. That didn't quite come to pass. And one of the reasons why was because the cost of integrating distributed generation was very, very high. And, and what you saw especially in smaller scale uh, implementations was the fact that the site and custom engineering required to make these small systems work together you know was often two-thirds or at least half the cost of the equipment that was being installed and so it just was not economic and so what happened uh is uh bob lasser who's really kind of the brains behind the microgrid you know, he went on sabbatical in New Zealand in, in the mid 1990s, and he had this epiphany that he could translate all these concepts about grid formation into inverter controls, and that we could actually create inverter based microgrids. And that's really what led to this entire R&D project. And you'll see that the, the goal was really to make these systems operate 
uh, and do so in a way that would be cost effective. And so that would support the advancement of distributed generation. We did a lot of, and I'll talk quite a bit about sort of the, uh, the approach and the idea of having plug and play components. And in particular, the, the, the importance of not having fast communications to enable the controls. But, you know, we went through this entire process. We were supported by the Department of Energy initially. You know, there's a lot of design and simulation work and, you know, bench scale testing at the University of Wisconsin. But ultimately, we realized that to gain industry acceptance, in particular utility industry acceptance, we would have to demonstrate this at scale. We were very fortunate at the time to be supported by the California Energy Commission to actually build a full-scale testbed at the American, uh, with, uh, with the support of the American Electric Power Company in Columbus, Ohio. And I'll talk a little bit about sort of the history of why we, why a, why a, a California R&D program sponsored the building of a testbed in another state. Uh, that's quite an interesting story in and of itself. But uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, we were very interested in, in developing these guidelines for how you would integrate these sources. And ultimately, we're trying to commercialize some of the IP, which Bob was very successful in doing in licensing the control uh, algorithms to um, Kikogen in the commercial product line. Let's turn now to uh, a little more stage setting and what distinguished the work that we were trying to accomplish from the general topic of microgrids. You know, microgrids, as we all know, are about uh, systems of distributed generation that can operate grid connected or grid uh, grid in the in islanded mode independent of the grid. We have some very specific ideas in our concept that we're going to reduce the cost of the microgrid. The first was to have the uh, interconnection with the main grid occur through a single point of common coupling. And the cost reduction that was going to occur here is then rather than have 1547 certification at each uh, a micro source within the microgrid, we could do it just one time at the point of common coupling. The second innovation we we're pursuing was this idea, and this we'll talk quite a bit about, is this peer-to-peer -peer autonomous coordination among the sources without, without high-speed communication. There are a lot of uh, discussions about how you would control these microgrids, and many of them had this huge overlay of communications, which to our mind was just a single point of failure, that if you lost it, you would lose control of your microgrid. So the idea of having micro sources that could sense and react to local conditions and behave appropriately was really a tremendous cost advantage, both in terms of reliability, getting away from say a master slave relationship, and also eliminating the need for this uh, a single point of failure in terms of these extremely expensive and, and sophisticated communication techniques. Again, the idea was to have this to be plug and play. We could do this on, on vendor uh, independent platforms. And because we didn't need fast communications, we could, uh, we could also use uh, an energy management system for just dispatch commands that could operate on a much slower time scale. And in fact, we did build a, 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 an energy manager that's called DURCAM. Many of you are familiar with it both a design and operational tool developed at my laboratory for the control of distributed generation systems. Now, in terms of the uh, demonstration, uh, there were two specific uh, unique features. One is we had very small sources. Again, we were trying to lower the cost of, you know, of, of getting these systems to work you know, when the, when, the, when the micro sources themselves are quite small. When you have a microgrid of tens of megawatts, you can afford a lot of engineering to do these controls. Uh, but when you're trying to like get this out at scale on these very smaller scales, the site engineering and the custom engineering required to make these things work was just overwhelming. We were trying to really focus on these smaller scale systems in order to enable you know, larger deployment of these things. And then importantly, because we were working with the utility, this was again in the, in the early aughts, uh, we weren't allowed to flow power back onto the grid. That was one of the requirements they had for us in working with them. So, Let's move on. Let's talk about some of these concepts. Now, I recall that Wei, and I hope he's on the call, gave a wonderful talk earlier, um, I think it was at the beginning of this year, in, 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 the, in the winter Unify series, when we talked about some of the search controls. And so I'm not gonna show any equations. I'm just gonna show, uh, talk about some concepts, and then we can, you can refer to the literature if you wanna really delve into this. 
But some of the key elements of this control were that the, we would use a grid forming voltage source devices with the ability to autonomously control voltage and frequency. It control vo voltage free, uh, locally using a droop control, and that would ensure stability without a lot of circulating, uh, you know, to minimize circulating or to avoid entirely circulating reactive power. Specifically during islanded operation, we would share load uh, and, and regulate frequency using droop control. And this very, very innovative concept that Bob had about using what we call P-min and P-max controls. I know Wade talked quite a bit about, I'll show some examples of it. Uh, clearly, uh, in, in, and again, the key here was to have these microbes operate under very stressed conditions. So we're gonna like really emphasize those times when the microbe is under, a, you can make these things work under steady state, you know, relatively easily. It's when you have these changes in load or changes in generation, when you go into ionated mode or when one, uh, you, one unit is becoming overload and you need to share loads, that's when it becomes very difficult to control these. And that's where we really want to push these controls. So we did a lot of work on protecting them in overloads. And then of course, uh, the whole idea of clustering them at a, uh, behind a common point, a single point of common coupling to facilitate the transition between grid connected and island mode. Let's now uh, take a look at the microgrid. What, what, what do you build? This is what we put together. This is out uh, in uh, near Columbus, Ohio. Um, we work with the American Electric Power. This is a company that had a long history of, 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 of transmission distribution uh, uh, R&D work. Uh, AEP, you may recall the transmission level is the only company in the country that's operating a 755 KV transmission line. They've really been at the forefront of R&D for many years. And we work with them uh, both because of their reputation, but also because we were at the time, you know, California was very engaged in this rule 21, these interconnection standards. And one of the things we were trying to do was to show the California utilities in particular, Edison, San Diego, and, and uh, PG&E, that you could operate these microgrids in a way that would comply with the interconnection requirements. Both PG&E and Southern California Edison wanted to build the microgrid because, you know, we were using money from the California Energy Commission to do this. But we realized that they would have a conflict of interest if they both were operating this microgrid that we were going to try and convince their distribution interconnection engineers, you know, was safe to operate. And so by picking a neutral third party, uh, one with a stellar reputation like the American Electric Power, you know, we really had a test bed here that they could kick the, that the California utilities could kick the tires on. And they did. And that really led to the, uh, led to the robustness of some of our findings. So here's what we put together. You know, we have this enclosure over here on the left. And originally we had three Tico Gen pre-commercial uh, prime movers. I talked earlier about the fact that we wanted to put capstones in there. Well, capstone almost went bankrupt in the middle of our contract negotiations with them. And we found out through our, our, our project manager at the California Energy Commission that in fact, uh, Tico Gen, which is an internal combustion engine based distributed generation system was putting inverters on their engines specifically for pollution control because they could then run uh, the engines at a point that minimized the emissions past the California emission uh, requirements and do so by operating essentially with an inverter-based uh, interface to the grid. And that was, that was music to our ears because, and they were very eager to innovate and work with us to put our controls into uh, pre-commercial versions of their, uh, of their inverters and ultimately to adopt it into the commercial product line. Uh, we had a number of load banks. We separated the load banks from the, uh, from the generation with these long, long uh, uh, cable runs to increase the impedance between the loads and the generator. Uh, we had a lot of special loads. We wanted to look at harmonic and in particular motor starting loads. Uh, we have the data acquisition system and then very importantly, the static switch, which is really the front end of uh, SNC Electric's pure wave system which allows us to uh, interconnect and, and, uh, and island uh, more or less seamlessly from the grid. And what you don't see here is the trailer that's just off the picture. That's where the data acquisition would feed uh, the information and where the micro was actually controlled for by the engineers there at AEP. Go to the next slide in a little more a little detail there. Um, here, what we're showing, I'm gonna go a little fast. I realize I'm, I'm, I'm talking too much here. It's a very, uh, there's six different zones. 
And one of the first concepts we had was this zone six in the centers, uh, which was that when you, when you went into a good isolated mode, you would take some of the non-critical load off the musket. Again, you would keep all the loads that you needed to keep on co-located with, with the generation behind this grid interface, which, which is shown at the interface between zone one and zone two. And then uh, we would have in the, in the islanded microgrids these zones uh, two, three, four, and five, three and four having both generation and loads within them, as, you know, lots of relays between them. And then of course, this is where all the load metering and the data collection would be taking place. So what we're gonna be doing then is stepping through these uh, uh, experiments of, uh, of either taking the, you know, working in an island condition or a grid connecting condition uh, making step changes in the loads uh, or dropping off generation and then really trying to sort of see how the microgrid would perform and record all this information from each of those tests, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, we did evolve the microgrid over time. This uh, shows the original configuration with the three generators each in zones three, four, and five. Those were identical Tico Gen 60KW machines. One of the first things we did, if you'll click first here, is we we replaced one of the generators with the commercial grade Tico Gen in Verde uh, 100 kW unit, which is what they now sell commercially. The next uh, uh, modification we made is we replaced one of the Tico Gens with a synchronous generator. Again, to, again, we were trying to show this vendor independence of these controls, and we wanted to show that a synchronous generator could operate in harmony with these inverter-based con uh, controls. And then the final step was to add energy storage which is contracted with Princeton Power to put in a battery uh, and, and put the controls into the inverters uh, between the battery and the rest of the microgrid. And so we have a whole series of tests that we went through of trying to uh, see if we can make this thing break by putting it under very stressed conditions. Um, let's talk about what some of those tests look like. These are some of the ones that Wei showed in his earlier talk. Here's a test in where we're going from grid connected to grid isolated operations. So you see the static switch power in the top panel go from around 20 kW to a drop. Now in this sense, in this instance, all three of the uh, generators, which are you know, 60 kW machines are operating well below their, their threshold. So there's plenty of headroom for them to pick up the load uh, following this troop control as soon as the grid goes away. And you can just see basically the current increasing uniformly on all three of those machines uh, simultaneously. So that's one of the easier tests for us when there's headroom on, on, the, on the sources and they lose the, the, the feed from the grid. The next test is one where uh, we have the, one of the units dispatched close to the top of its range, that's A2, and then A1 has, is dispatched below, uh, below its, its uh, full capacity. And so when you have this step change in load, uh, you see that A1, A2 gets uh, driven into an overload condition, uses the Pmax control that uh, Wade talked about in his earlier talk to uh, essentially uh, limit the, uh, you know, basically drive the, uh, the engine back down to its, its normal operating point and force the load onto uh, to be picked up by A1 by this difference in phase angles as a result of the way in which the, uh, the, the Pmax controller operates. And this was a very powerful technique for allowing the microgrid to re essentially redispatch itself automatically using the PMAX controller. In the next example, we had an even more extreme uh, case of going, uh, essentially taking off the energy storage system in this case, but with both of these units being operated very close to their maximum power point, uh, they basically cannot uh, maintain, uh, the, 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 they cannot serve the load. And so we had under frequency load shedding take power off about a half second in and allow the microgrid to survive. So again, these are all these edge cases that we tried to sort of uh, prove out the survivability of the microgrid in these, uh, uh, these essentially standalone conditions. So you've seen all this, we talked about why this works and it's all documented in these documents that we put this, this key dot. So if you're interested in working with the, the test fed data, what you need to do is doc, uh, grab this uh, document, which both provides the history of the project, but also, and very, very importantly, you know, lists all the all the academic publications that came out of it, and very importantly, in this section four two, lists every one of the technical reports. Could you go back one, Karen? 
lists every technical report that was generated by the project through the different phases and the different combinations of units that were in there. And now what's key to them is what's on the next slide, which is a cross reference between the tests we conducted. So what is the test description? Which distributed generation units were involved or combinations were involved? Which uh, a test report uh, corresponds to those sets of tests given the, that they occurred at different times? And then specifically, which page in the report contains uh, the, the findings from that, that testing that was done in the different phases of the project. So what you see is a whole bunch of types of tests that we conducted, uh, many combinations of the distributed generators that were involved, uh, the documentation for it. And now what Kieran's gonna do is talk to you about you know, how you get access to the data that underlies all these tests. So let me stop talking and turn it over to Kieran to continue. For this presentation uh that's great thanks john so uh yeah so um uh uh as joe said we've made all this data public during the summer it's all available at the link at the bottom here of this slide um on figshare it's uh it's uh it's a, 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 a it's a, a, a little over eight gigabytes, and there's a total of uh, thirteen hundred and forty two individual events. For each of those events, we had up to up to uh, 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 thirteen individual meters. For for some events, we had we had less meter data. If we were testing an individual uh, device in standalone versus testing the system, and then each meter is re recording the data at three point eight four uh, uh, kilohertz. the The test data covers all three stages of the project, so that is the inverter operating as an sorry the system operating as an all uh, inverter based system. The system operating with both inverters and machines, and then some of those testing with the uh, the battery storage system and the smart loads, as Joe mentioned, and all of the data about the system is available uh, 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 in those reports that Joe pointed to. So all of the inf all of the information about the cables, transformers, the certs controllers, that's all out there public. So the data is there, the um, the system information is there, the controller data is there. Basically, everything is out there that you need to build these systems in simulation and benchmark these models. Uh, so, as Joe said, the the test data is very exhaustive in the types of events. So there's uh, there's a list here. I'm not going to go through them, but basically, you know, unbalanced. Um, motor loads, islanded, all those type of events were um, were conducted to tour the course of the project and for which we have some experimental uh, data for. So if you have a look at the data, each of the folders will have a test log. So this is an, uh, a spreadsheet we can open. And the first thing you'll see is at the top of every test log, is the corresponding uh, the corresponding uh, report as well as a link to that report, and then on the right hand side of the test log, you see the sequence of startup activities and experimental settings for each test. So, so this is things like what were the, were the juke gains used for each unit, what were the the PI gains, what was the active and reactive power operating conditions of the microgrid. And you'll also see what event was introduced during the experiment to cause a transient. So in here, it was um, it was a step change in the load, as you see on the right. And then finally, there'll be a confirmation that there was a successful capture of the waveform data. And also, each test will have a note whether it was saying saying it was sorry, saying whether it was successful or unsuccessful. So we've chosen 
to leave all of the data in here in case there was some settings from an unsuccessful test that were then used for the following tests. So we really did a raw dump of all of the data for these experiments. And in addition, we also include that data in the data set in case anybody wants to understand why specific tests fail or if anyone, if anyone wanted to do some event classification or event analysis on the data, just having that data, having both the voltage and the current data, even for a test that was um, ultimately not uh, not as, uh, successful. And then on the far left, you'll see the information about where the or what specific folder that test data uh, is in. There are some more information here, like test dates and test times. We've chosen to include these in, in case anyone thinks there's a mistake in the data and wants to um, email me with a question or wants to ask, um, are you sure that this, this meter wasn't online at this day and this time? I can go back to the data and check that. So that's the experimental notes file. Each phase of the project and each subfolder will have one of these. The uh, experimental notes from phase one don't have as much detail, but phase two and phase three uh, should be pretty exhaustive. So now onto the specific data itself. So the data, as I said, it's grouped according to each, 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 stage, each stage of the project. And the data is saved in in um a in um a parquet file format. For those of you who are not familiar with this, this is an open source, very efficient way to store data, very fast to read and write, and it's very easily um accessible by 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 most uh, tools. So each uh each file will have the date the the date stamp of the event in absolute terms. So that's the first column, this, uh, the day time. Then it'll have the event time. So the event time is the window that, that was captured by the DFR. So an event time of zero seconds is where the meter thinks the event has happened. And then it'll give you roughly 300 milliseconds before the event and four seconds afterwards. And then we have the data itself, the, the voltage measurements for all three phases in percentage of the normal, as well as measurements for all, all three phases of the current. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, this data uh, is really easy to ingest and play with in, in most tools. So here's an example in MATLAB, where you just use the, the parquet read a command. You pass it the location of the data, and then you, it'll ingest that data as a table and you interact with that table the same as you would any data in MATLAB. And then if you have Python, the pandas package has, has a, a read parquet command and you just pass that uh, the file link and then it'll read that into a pandas, uh, a pandas uh, uh, data frame. So very easy to interact with, very easy to ingest. So that's a summary of, of how you access the data, how you interpret the test logs, and how you import the data to play with it. So now I'm going to quickly move on to some of the initial work that we've been doing with the data. And then I'm going to finish with some, some future work and trying to foster some, some uh, uh, feedback and discussion. So um, under Unify, one of the tasks that we're going to be working on is to develop a set of benchmark microgrid um, I, 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 I use cases. So on the left here is just a quick snapshot of the search microgrid control. As Joe said, there was an excellent presentation from Wei, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. And then on the right-hand side is a model of the search microgrid in MATLAB that we're using. So the idea here is that we're able to use the measurement data to play back the operating conditions of the grid. We build the models of all the, the, the controllers, the machines, the Pmax controller, the, the smart loads, and we're able to play back the event data, recreate the test conditions, and then um, benchmark our models to make sure they're performing as expected. So this is just a simple 
simple event that, that we've been playing with. So there was a voltage tag on the the distribution system, the control logic of the microgrid switch caused it to open. And that caused the micro switch to transition from being grid connected into island mode. And here we see that happened at T, uh, T is equal to zero seconds. So you see oh, open the top, the top right, you see the active power from one of the um, inverters. So at T equals zero, you see a jump in the active power as it takes on the extra load from the microgrid. And then just a snapshot of, of the waveforms um, on phase A of that for the current and voltage. So we, we still have some some tweaking some tweaking of the models uh, to do, but this is the type of event um, validation that we're looking to do to benchmark um, these models. As I said earlier, there is a lot of events. There's almost fourteen hundred events. So we're hoping with the help of of both the uh, partners in Unify as well as anyone outside of Unify who's interested that we can kind of Boil that 1300 down to maybe the most important 20, 30, 40 events and build validated versions of those. So, so yeah, as I mentioned, um, so moving forward, we're looking to develop a set of validated benchmark microgrid use cases based upon this data. And that'll be both in uh, collaboration with our partners on Unify as well as anyone else who's interested in providing comments, feedback, or working with the data. The test set is, is very broad, um, 1,400 events. So we would, we're would welcoming as much feedback and ideas as possible. There is a lot of uh, isolation testing of individual units. So there's a lot of tests uh, that I carried out uh, multiple times. So it's not necessarily 1,300 uh, uh, unique events and obviously as I said earlier some of those events um, is bad data or bad tests so we're hoping to get this down to a subset of the most valuable uh, use cases and um, if anyone has any questions or working with the data um, I'll be more than happy to answer us so once we have the initial set of kind of benchmark models uh, in, implemented, but then we're also going to work under the part of Unify to implement more advanced uh, controllers. So one of the kind of the, the tricky things for these inverters is to try and limit the maximum current join of fault condition. So we see here on the left, one of the experiments uh, during the search program, when the, the, there was no upper limit plate placed on the current, there was a fault the current exceeded the safe operating conditions of the inverter and the inverter trips offline. So that's on the left. But now if you look to the right, one of the approaches developed during the search project, they were able to implement it on the converter and um, to, to make sure that the converter did not exceed the safe operating limits. So the same fault happens again because it was introduced intentionally. And they, we, we see now, instead of a maximum fall current of 640, we see like 320. And the inverter is able to stay online and continue to, to provide good services after the fault has been cleared. So in this case, this a lot of the search inverters were intentionally oversized to, to provide a large amount of fall current. So as we switch into more... Um, more commercial inverters that, that are available now, they might not be able to say, provide the same level of fault current. So we might need more uh, a tighter regulation on the maximum fault current. So once we have the initial benchmarks implemented, so they then we we'll move towards invent, implementing some of these more advanced uh, techniques. And finally, uh, this is our last slide in terms of content, but it's a slide I'm hoping my might get some, um, might open up to some feedback and discussion here on the call. And that's what else is this data useful for? Obviously, there's been a lot of talk about performance requirements and testing grid farming resources. There was an excellent chapter on this in the recent grid farming report from ESIC that, that talked about how do you test these in the lab? How do you do, do, you do bench, top, bench top testing? 
And then how do you test these continuously in the field? Those tests are going to be very different. How you interpret the data, how you measure performance are going to be very different. And we think that with the um, abundance of information about the system, the search controllers, they're all public, the fact that the test set was so exhaustive across uh, both inverter systems and mixed source systems, we think that there's a lot of value in this in this data set, and this data set can inform these conversations and maybe um, provide something that we can point towards and reference when we're talking about how to, to both specify and measure uh, performance of these devices, both in the lab and in the field. As I mentioned earlier, these, uh, these devices were both tested independently, as well as part of a system, both in grid connected mode, as well as in island mode. So we, we think the, uh, the breadth and depth of the test set is really, really valuable in that sense. And then finally, uh, in terms of event classification, if, if anyone was interested, this data is already in a nice format for event analysis. What I mean by that is the fact that the, the DFR, it triggers and saves the data at t equals zero. The events are already centered. Uh, the voltage data is already uh, um, uh, it's normalized. Uh, so all you have to do is take the current data and normalize that, and you're already on your way to being able to test this data out on a lot of either classical event analysis or some more uh, advanced machine learning uh, techniques. So that's it for the content we have. Um, if there's any questions or feedback or comments about this, uh, we'd love to foster more discussion about this data. As I said, just, just to reinforce this data is it's a very big data set. So we're really hoping to get as many hands on deck as possible and trying to get some value out of it. So I'll just throw up my e email um, here real quick. If anyone wants to email us to get their hands dirty playing with the data set, I'm more than happy to uh, answer as many questions and help people to get, to get up to speed with the, the, the data. I'll jump back to this slide in the hopes of somebody might have something clever to say. <laughs> All righty, thanks guys for the great talk.